Hi, welcome to the NASCAR and NBC podcast. I'm your host, Nate Ryan, joined by Steve Letarte, who is just back from Homestead Miami Speedway, where yesterday we saw Christopher Bell win the round of eight race to advance to the championship round with Kyle Larson. And we saw a lot of other things happen with some championship contenders, namely Denny Hamlin, Martin Truex Jr. I want to get to all that. Uh, but Stevie, first, thanks for being here. Second, let's just let's start with the race itself and it seemed like it was going to be a fairly typical, straightforward playoff special. All the playoff drivers, it felt like running in the top 10, except for Chris Buescher for a lot of the race. And then what we all thought was going to be final pit stop, Kyle Larson makes the, this mistake, runs into Ryan Blaney, hits the barrels, red flag, and it seemed like the race just sort of went off the rails from that point forward. So is that was that kind of, I know you're always big on turning points. Was that the big turning point in this race? Well, it really was. I think if that pit cycle happens clean, um, then perhaps we get a, a, a mundane Miami race. Uh, you know, last year, only two playoff cars finished inside the top 10, and I was shocked that there was that much of an issue. This year, it was the haves and the have-nots. One through four were all playoff cars. The next playoff car was outside the top 20. So there wasn't a playoff car between 5th and 20th. Um, and I think that kind of speaks to it. Now, three of those had issue. Chris Buescher had an issue, but his issue was just not fast. They just didn't have a very good car um, and didn't have a very good performance. But without a doubt, the moment was the Larson Blaney coming to pit road where Larson just misjudged his entry speed versus Blaney. Um, you know, in the end, you I'm going to hang the mistake on Kyle Larson. So I look at it like this. It's no different than if I'm sitting behind you at a red light, Nate. If the light turns green and you don't go and I drive into your rear bumper, it's still my fault. Just because the light was green doesn't mean I can leave. I still have to wait for you to leave. That's exactly the right. same thing we saw between Blaney and Kyle Larson. I did a little, you know me, I love my numbers. So I dig a little dip. Uh, I, I did a little digging. First round of green flag pit stops. This is pit in. So this is kind of middle of the backstretch to pit road entry. Kyle Larson beats Ryan Blaney by nearly a half second. At 114, he beats him in that same stretch by nearly a second. Hmm. So I'm going to give Larson the assumption that he was going to make pit road speed. Tough assumption, but he had done it twice, so I'll say he was going to. Um, if he doesn't hit the barrels, it's the move of the race. I mean, he passes the 12 car in that pit cycle all because of pit entry. So that's what he was doing, and that shows just how much you have to push. We're the round of eight. We're not the round of 12 anymore. We're not the regular season. We're not the round of 16. Average is below average. You need to be above average. Now, the risk of trying to be above average um, is you saw it, right? Kyle Larson absolutely either was going to wreck Ryan Blaney or hit the barrels. He chose the barrels. Uh, but you got to hang the mistake on Kyle Larson, even though it was an impressive run to pit road. And is it also a case of just divergent approaches here? You know, like you said, this is what you got to do. This is the kind of risks. This is how much you got to push it for Kyle Larson to get in front of Blaney, come out in first and probably control the race to the end because he was so good throughout that race. But the, the divergent approaches of Kyle Larson's locked in. He's got the win from Las Vegas. So he can afford to push the envelope a little bit more. And then Ryan Blaney, who we've seen him have these pit mistakes uh, throughout the playoffs, just mistakes in general, but he's been caught on speeding in, in the pits before. He's tiptoeing, it seemed like, a little bit more. Was it just a case of one guy's got one objective, the other guy's got another, and they just sort of collided there? So a little bit, I think, is situational awareness, and I do think Blaney was being a little conservative, uh, which I applaud, right, because speeding there is just a mistake they can't have happen. So I do think Blaney was managing it correctly. But I don't think what we saw out of the five car was situational awareness. I think that's Kyle Larson. I think that's Kyle Larson mm -hmm. 365. I mean, that's Kyle Larson every single day <laughs> he races, whether it has a wing on it, whether it has treaded tires or slicks, whether it's on the high banks or the flats. Uh, and I'm guessing whether it's IndyCar or NASCAR. I mean, that's Kyle Larson. He is pedal down, doesn't care about the setup. Tell me what you need me to do. I'm going to go do it. Tell me what you need me to do next stage, next stage. Don't clutter my mind or waste my time with the plan. You just just shoot me out of the can and let me go. And, and you know, we're going to talk a lot about relationships because the radios were on fire yesterday. And I think a lot of it has to do with where we are in the season and what's on, at stake. But I think a lot of the relationship is you also have to manage. If you're a crew chief, you have to build a team that accentuates your driver's strengths. So if you have, uh, uh, you know, Tom Brady 
and you're running the option, well, shame on you. You have the slowest quarterback ever to stand in the pocket, right? Like, so my example is it's so obvious to see in other sports, in other sports, right? You can say, oh, this guy has a great arm, bad feet, passing offense. This guy, Patrick Mahomes, we're going to get him out of the pocket, make magic happen, right? It's so clear. Basketball is the same way. If you have Steph Curry, you run a lot of, you know, pretty spread out offenses, try to get the ball in his hands behind the arc. Well, in racing, I don't think it's as clear, but those signatures absolutely still exist. You know, like, for instance, Chris Gabehart and Kyle Larson, you couldn't have two different approaches. Chris Gabehart, numbers, analytical percentages, green lights, red lights, good scores, bad scores. Denny eats it up. Denny agrees with them. They talk the same language, right? Now you have Kyle Larson, who Cliff Daniels is in charge. Like, it's his race team. This is how we're going to do it. Um... Kyle Larson's the man. Don't get me wrong. He could have whatever he wants around him. And it's very clear that he wants someone like Cliff Daniels. And Cliff Daniels is a great ax, uh, accent to Kyle Larson because he's the opposite. He's not a general. He's an artist. Um, and what he does behind the wheel, he can't even tell you how he's so fast. What he tells you behind mm -hmm. the wheel is, is artistic. So what my point in circling all this back is that's just Kyle Larson. Like, I don't think if he would have won last week or didn't win last week, he gets the barrels. Like, I don't yeah. think it makes a difference coming to pit road. I think he is all in every lap, not throwing you – no, know, it was a mistake, um, and he'll continue to learn from them. But, you know, he's – this is who he is. He's a, he's a multi-time race winner each and every year and multi-time DNF guy. This point system actually probably couldn't be better for Kyle Larson. I don't know how much he would succeed in a 36-point championship or 36-race championship. Yeah. yeah. And, hey, we saw that the last round where, you know, he essentially like almost – Took himself out, but he rallied, and then he wins the opener of the round of eight because, like you said, I don't think he modulates that style of his. That's just – I, Listen, I like the firepower. Powers. Yeah, Like, I like the firepower. Uh, in today's short memory, short-term entertainment, uh, social media, 30-second videos, instant rewards, instant gratification, I like a race team like that. I like a guy that has absolute firepower. Name a racetrack other than a super speedway where Kyle Larson isn't top three favorites in Vegas doesn't exist because mm -hmm. what you saw in this round is Kyle Larson's year. Every race you say, who was good? Well, Kyle Larson. And then you say, but, and it's either, but he won or something happened and he DNF'd or didn't have a chance to win, but he was in every conversation. That's impressive. Yeah. Uh, and Obviously, his team is fully behind him as well. I'm sure Cliff Daniels, you know, they have those talks every week that do what you got to do. I think that he gets a ton of leeway. But I, I, as you said, crew chief driver relationships were a big part of this race. And I thought you touched on something really interesting there, comparing it to Gabe Hamlin. And before we get into the drivers screaming at each other or uh, screaming at their teams, which we saw a lot of that in this race. Let, let's talk briefly about Gabe Hardhamlin, because I think you're right, Stevie, that Denny loves stats. He loves numbers. He loves that he's got the analytics guy in Gabe Hart. And we saw it in stage one in particular, where Gabe Hart said, I don't care what anybody else is doing. We're going to figure this car out, and we're going to go long uh, on our before making our first stop, longer than anybody else. And at the end of the stage, Hamlin, I think, had a net gain of one position, but for a while it looked like he might not get any position, especially if like a yellow came out or something. And at the end of the stage, Hamlin's like, good job, Chris. That was a good strategy. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess that tells you what you need to know about Hamlin Gabehart and, and why they kind of work well together. There's a lot of drivers that can't manage that strategy. When they come back on the racetrack, even with fresher tires, they lose their mind. Um, they scream about pinning too late. They scream about, they worry about everything except for driving the race car, which is what they should be worrying about. Um, and Denny Hamlin's the opposite. And, you know, it has to be so frustrating to sit out there on old tires watching cars that you've beat all day long zoom past you on new tires, knowing you're losing time. But this belief in one another, and I think it comes with great communication during the week, right? I don't know this to be true, but I can't believe, you know, Gabe Hart just dreamt this up and Denny just believed 100%. I think he was explained why it should work explain the math and then executed stage one was a net one stage two was a huge gain it was like four and a half five seconds faster than most other cycles uh it was a big gain in position now look there's a risk if you get a caution in the last 20 laps of that run uh the advantage is is um kind of gone away it's thrown out the window um it's negated and 
I think that's the risk you have to have. And when that happens, even Game Heart wasn't quite sure because Denny said great strategy. And he goes, well, I appreciate that, but I'm not sure it was. Uh, but in stage yeah. two, they stuck to it. and It was good again. And actually, that's what we missed in stage three. Um, we talk about the Larson Blaney wreck, but I was so fascinated to see what the 11 did because it was a longer stage. Everybody was still shortening it. I actually think the 11 was in position to win that race. Um, how about this? I don't know who was going to win the race, but if it would have just cycled through, we were getting ready to have one of the most epic final 15 laps possible with old tires sliding and new tires chasing. Um, I know most people don't see that, but I like to skip ahead in the book. And the last chapter said that the last 15 laps was going to be amazing. Now, we got a still a great finish uh, with Bell trying to holding off a uh, hard charging Ryan Blaney. But but it was going to be a different feel for sure. Yeah, and it all changed again after the red flag for the Larson crash. And then you had Hamlin and Blaney battle. And Hamlin, we don't really know what happened, but, you know, some sort of part failure or flat tire he hits so, the wall. He's it's out. not a flat tire. So I've watched this a couple of no. times. So on the in car, you see a hitch in the wheel. So, so when he gets all done, the tire has air in it. So I'm willing to say it's not a flat tire. I don't feel like it's a suspension failure because there's no bottoming out or sparking where the car makes a drop. I don't believe it's a steering hmm. failure as far as a part breaking, because if you watch his hands um, and I know the listener can't see me, but your right hand, you know, so you're at 10 and two. You turn down in the corner. Now your right hand is close to midnight, straight up, straight up top. When you have a flat tire or steering brake, the wheel turns left. Your right hand continues to turn left even though the car goes right. If you rewatch the in-car, you get a shutter in the wheel left to right, but then his hands don't turn left. His hands stay in the same position as the car goes right. It's almost like a hydraulic issue. Uh, it's it, it, it's going to be really interesting to see what they find out because I don't think the failure is as simple as a part breaking or air coming out. I think this is an internal mechanical issue. Um, hmm. So you know me, I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to the nuts and bolts. Um, so I'm going to let the pain settle a little bit, but I'm going to make sure I talk to Mr. Gabe Hart here maybe Thursday or Friday of this week, and I'd love to see what he's willing to tell me. And I understand if it's nothing uh, because the steering is is best is a very important part of this car that teams have found advantages on. But it, it, it was a very odd failure and then a big hit. We didn't talk a lot about it because he kind of – Drove it back around, but that was a that was a tough hit at a bad angle. Yeah, uh, the right front, and he went straight into it. Like you said, gave, gave him no warning. Um, and you're going to be talking to Chris Gabehart. Gabehart wasted no time in talking to his driver. Um, we caught it on the NASCAR NBC cameras. That was a great shot where Gabehart essentially puts his arm around Hamlin's neck and is whispering something in his ear for. A good 20, 30 seconds. Um, I know you weren't privy to that conversation, but you probably have some insight on what a crew chief might tell his driver right after something like that. What do you think Chris Gabehart's message was to Denny Hamlin when he appeared, like you said, he, he was in contention to win this race, has it get away from him, no fault of his at, at all, and now has to regroup outside the cut line, going to Martinsville. What do you think Chris Gabehart did? Uh, well, you got to understand that, that, you know, Denny has been very bullish about his opportunity this year. He's, he's been very vocal that this has been his year and then it seems to be falling apart. And if I'm Chris Gabehart, I'm letting him know that before you even have time for negativity to set in that we're gonna, we're good. We're moving forward. We're on to Martinsville. Like I would move the ball forward as fast as possible. I would take ownership that we've had an issue as the crew chief. Anything that happens on that race car is your responsibility. Even in these big corporations where you may not touch the part, you sign the dotted line. It's your car. And I think that's Chris taking you know, responsibility for the car. But if I was Chris, knowing how bullish Denny is, um, you know, we're talking a Hall of Famer with a championship lacking on the resume. I don't think the championship's going to define him. He's been very vocal about that, but he's also been very vocal that this is our year. And I would remind him that we knew there would be setbacks. Nothing has changed. And that would be as simple as that. I would let him know that if he thinks this car is sitting in front of us in the pit stall with the right front damaged, if you think this is going to define our year, then you're wrong. Then in six and a half days from now, we're going to the track that we run the absolute best at. And we're going to remind everybody why this is our year. We knew it wasn't going to be easy. And guess what? It's not easy. And that, I mean, that would have been the message. It would have been as simple as that. Um, because if you don't have that same, whatever you want to call it, but that same sort of approach, that same sort of we can walk through that brick wall approach, then I think 
doubt can kind of slip in, right? And Denny flies on his own. He's not with the team. There's going to be separation. He has to go to the infield career center. I don't know if I'm going to see him after the infield career center, right? I wouldn't allow any doubt to creep in. I would refocus the team right then, right there, that moment that we haven't even left Pitt Road at Miami and we are on to Martinsville. Yeah, that's a great point. I haven't thought about that, that Hamlin actually hadn't been in the care center at that point. He was stopped at the pit stall before he had to go there. So that's that rare instance where a crew chief has the time to, to say something to his driver. And, you know, it certainly seemed like Gabe Hart and Hamlin are on the same page, whereas other drivers, it didn't seem like it was that way, Stevie. I mean, Chris Rebell kind of giving it back to Adam Stevens a little bit near the end of stage two saying, okay, I'm just going to start trying harder now. He's a little bit snarky. and then. I know we keep talking about, it, but Martin Truex Jr. and James Small, uh, Truex got upset about another slow pit stop um, and, you know, was yelling at his guys. Um, your take on that. And are you surprised that, and I know that we, you said it, you said it yesterday in the broadcast again, that this is the MO of James Small and Martin Truex Jr. They have this understanding, but at some point, is there a limit to how much a driver should be yelling at his team? Well, so the James Small Martin Trex thing, they're they're the um, you know, the couple trying to work through rough waters and there's no friends helping them. And and the pit crew, you know, no one on the team, no pit crew, like nobody's stepping up to make this easier. Right? Like it's already Martin will be the first guy to tell you, and James will agree that the, the strategy got him off last week. Um, you know, Martin and James joked about it when I talked to him in the pre-race on the radio, like, well, hopefully we'll get the strategy right, you know. But then you take a heated situation for the regular season champ who has had a debacle. I mean, their, their playoffs is as cold a streak as you can get on. Everything has gone wrong. And then you have unacceptably slow pit stops. I mean, I'll say it. Like, I don't want – here's the thing. Everyone's human. Everyone makes mistakes. And we aren't heart surgeons. We're not brain surgeons. We're not saving lives. It's just sports. But don't pretend that the best deserve to win. Everybody can't be the best. And you know what I saw? Pit stops that were not deserving to win. I saw pit. That's not an effort thing. That's nothing attacking the character of those five people that go over pit wall. They are, I'm sure, working night and day trying to get better. But this is not, and you know, in today's polarized world, if you say somebody's not good, it's a personal attack. I'm sorry. That's not how sports work. I have the data. Mm -hmm. Slow. The answer is slow. The pit stops are slow. And they're slow when they matter. This isn't intramural football. This is professional sports. When the ball is dropped in the Super Bowl, do we go, but he's such a good guy running that route? You know, no, we say he <laughs> dropped the pass. So I I'm sorry. Pit crew guys get paid handsomely to do their job. They have all the effort in the world and they have to step up on the big stage. And just like the drivers make mistakes and James Small made it a week ago when the pit stops were fine, this week it was pit stops. And, and when you have a dry pile of leaves, which is this relationship or the 19 radio, and you start throwing sparks towards them, they catch on fire. And, and I mean, that's what we hear over the radio. And I think James is out of ideas to, you know, to kind of fire up Truex. I even said on the broadcast, I'm not sure I would try. I don't think I would try to talk Truex off the ledge. I have no mm -hmm. doubt that Truex is going to push the pedal, right? No matter what he's saying on the radio, he's going to push the pedal down. So I, I think I said around the broadcast that I would say, okay, here's where we are. With this many points behind, we're running in this position. These guys in front of you all for position. I would list the car numbers, and I would be quiet. And I would let Drew Herring and Martin Trex Jr. try to go get some points. Now, in the end, they broke a motor. It didn't matter. Not to mention the caution came out. I mean, they hit the trifecta. The hat trick of bad things happened in the 19 car, and why not? I know James Small is a lucky sock guy. Well, I'm going to text him this week and say, maybe try no socks. Maybe just go barefoot at Martinsville because <laughs> your lucky socks are not helping with the luck because you do make a lot of your own luck. A week ago, it was a strategy. This week, it was slow pit stops. But in the end, the caution, they have nothing to do with. The five hits the barrels. They get cycled out to a lap down. Um, it, it's just, you know, it, it was, it's just everything. It just keeps getting piled on. Um, and I hate it because I am friends with all of these guys. I hate it because I've walked in their shoes. I know what the pressure is like. And there's going to be sleepless nights. And it's easy for me to get on here and talk about it. Um, and But I have empathy for what it's like on the other side. I mean, it's, it's, 
it's hard to understand when you put your heart and soul into something and it isn't working out just how emotional that can be. And that's what you're hearing on the radio. Now, the other side of this is I understand this fiery radio, Truex, Bell, all of these drivers. Um, and as a crew chief, I would say I understand it because I had those fiery drivers as well. Jeff Gordon, Dale Jr. were not afraid to say stuff on the radio. Um, but from the outside looking in, man, it seems a bit childish at times. Like at what point is it too much? Now, Bell, I think, almost realized that he got out even after mm -hmm. the floor pit stop. What a team. My team is great. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say because if I was any of those crew chiefs, I'd be defending my driver and I'd be coaching until the checkered flag. But, man, I would love to just see a little bit of, of – of it, Dale Jr. and I had this conversation on the way home because Dale Jr. told me, he goes, man, it's a good thing I wasn't a crew chief because if I'd have heard half that stuff on the radio, I'd have just lost my mind. And I was like, well, yeah, you wouldn't have been a very good crew chief um, because your job <laughs> is to get the best finishes you can, can get regardless yeah. of the result. But, you know, as technology gets better, as scanners get more popular, as we pick it up on TV, as every social media outlet picks it up there, I mean, at some point, I think you have to get to your driver and be like, hey, man, look, this is kind of the old school way. This You just don't hear this as much out of the new wave of drivers. Yeah. Um, I'm going to read you something that Adam Stevens said afterward. Uh, Christopher Bell's crew chief, the winner. Because um, I think you're right. Sometimes these crew chiefs just let their drivers vent and just take it. And this is what Adam Stevens said. Sometimes he lets a little bit of emotion come out. Sometimes you need that. I scream my full head off on the box. Sometimes I don't key the mic. You've got to let it out. We put him in a bad spot. Probably should have mentioned that, that like Bell was upset because the changes they had made in stage two weren't working. We put them in a bad spot. Sometimes you got to tell them things that they don't want to hear. And sometimes they're going to tell you things maybe you don't want to hear. It's part of it. So listening to that from Adam Stevens, listening to what you told Dale Jr. about like, hey, you're not going to make it in a crew chief as a crew chief unless you've got tough skin. Is this what you sign up for as a crew chief is just getting yelled at? Sometimes. Well, I think you sign up for it if it's defendable. Um, you know, so, so what, what I hear right there from Adam Stevens is that, um, you know, he didn't feel that Christopher delivered something off color or at least unprompted, like mm -hmm. they didn't get the car better or this didn't happen or this didn't happen. It seems like he's okay with it because it sounds to me like when Christopher gets it off his chest, maybe he thinks Christopher's better for, you know, this is part of the relationships we, I can't analyze every driver the same. Because they aren't. Um, they, re they really aren't, right? There was some other radio communication between Larson and Cliff Daniels where, where Cliff said at the end of stage two after they lost the lead, he was like, okay, what do we need? Nothing. I just got racing too hard with a couple guys. I burned my tires off. And he was like, so we don't need to be better because the 12 just passed us. And then Larson got a little snippet. He'd be like, no, and I know what he did wrong. And then there was silence. And then he comes back and he basically is like, so am I adjusting the car or not? And I was like, man, I felt like I was sitting next to Chad for a minute. That was a very Chad Canals delivery right there. <laughs> and my point in that is what makes a good crew chief is understanding what makes the car finish as high as possible. And, and I know that sounds silly. But that's the objective. And a lot of emotion can derail your objective. So if Adam Stevens yeah. says we put him in a bad spot, sometimes I have to hear what I have to hear. I vent too. I just don't say it out to him. You know, no one knows Christopher Bell better, probably, on his team at least, than his crew chief. I mean, that's why they work what they do. I mean, look what they've been through a year ago. I mean, this is a guy that has been in these spots before. Um, so I'm not going to judge how they get there, but I will tell you, for the casual sports fan, you're like, man, it, it, some of the comments are a little pointed at times. Yeah, yeah. But when we think about... I mean, we like to describe NASCAR drivers as professional athletes. And we hear about the consummate professionals in other sports. We hear it's generally in reference to guys who ha are able to, to keep their emotions in check. And that's what we're. Well, so really I'm not going to say emotions in check. I think it's delivery. So here's the same thing. I'll use another analogy. When Tom Brady goes over, you know, slams his helmet down and grabs his, his lineman and says, let's get our shit together. We can't block. Like, what's the problem yeah. here? And he loses his mind. Everybody's like, oh, there he is, the greatest of all time, motivating his team. I like yeah. the emotion. I'm so, so some of it's personal. I don't like sarcasm. 
Like, I don't like sarcasm. I think it's disrespectful. I think it's unproductive. I don't like it. So when he says the leader's this far back and he says, okay, I'll start trying. Now, I, I don't work with Christopher. I like him. He's well-spoken. He's super talented. Um, that would rub me the wrong way. I would have to learn how to deal with that different. Because my answer would be like, I know you're trying. I didn't know if you could see the guy back there. Because if he laps us, we have a way bigger, you know. But Adam has all the right things to say. I mean, look, they had one of the, in a, in a year where everybody says you can't pass, you can't this, you can't that, you can't this. The guy went from outside the top 20 to winning the race in the last 100 laps. So mm -hmm. at a track where there's no two tires, stay out, you know, strategy. Nope. He passed all those cars. Passed them. Drove past them. So... You know, it's um, the other thing that's different about the sport is, you know, every player isn't live mic'd all the time. Mm -hmm. We should be thankful as NASCAR fans. We get to hear them work out of it. You know, I've never been in a locker room. I'd love to know what a locker room speech is. You know, I'd love to know what Tennessee said on Saturday in the locker room because it wasn't the right thing. Nick Saban said something else and Alabama <laughs> came back out and whipped up on Tennessee, right? So, so you get my point. We get those speeches post-event, right? Somebody's like, oh, here's a clip of the yeah. speech. Remember, we get to dissect this information in real time. And what I love about this, so the counter is, do I think it sometimes it sounds childish? I do. Now, the other side of the argument is, do I think it reminds me as an analyst that we can't make this a bigger deal than it already is, that this is, this is not just their careers. You aren't a race car driver, you know, clock in and clock out. You are a race car driver from, you know, toe to head, through and through everything. And this is all they've worked for their whole lives. This is what they've worked for all year long. And then when it goes away or you feel it's going away, it is hard to just sit back and smile. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that no one knows their driver better than their crew chief. Uh, and I think you're right. I'm sure nobody on the 20 knows Christopher Bell better than Adam Stevens. But I'm struck by the fact that the relationship between Bell and Stevens, or even like Gabe Hart Hamlin, obviously Truex Small, everybody's got their own different way of doing it. And like you and Dale Jr., obviously you guys were buds away from the track. I don't sense that as much with Bell and Stevens. You know, part of it is the age gap, but like, and I get a kick out of the fact that like Adam Stevens always refers to his driver by his last name. It's Bell, not Christopher. It's Bell. Like, I kind of, I kind of like that. It almost like establishes, different sort of parameters than maybe you see with other driver crew chief relationships where it's like, Hey, we're, we gotta be friends away from the track. They kind of do it differently. Can you speak to that? Like, how is it, how does it work? I guess each of those different sort of relationships where maybe some feel more professional, some might be more collegial, but you all sort of get to the same place in a different way uh, in terms of being able to win. Well, it has to start with that. You have to agree that the effort is equal to get to the goal. And it really starts as simple as that. Um, and I think at this point in the season with the people you're listing, we're already there, right? They're the eight best drivers or at least the eight best teams this year. That's why they move forward. That's what I'm going to label them as. People can like the point system, don't like the point system, but everybody's racing within it. So if you've made the round of eight, then I'm going to list you as the eight best in this season. Um, mm -hmm. it, but it's a long year. We have to remind everybody, we started in February down this path. Um, and for each one, there's a story. I like so Truex, they missed the playoffs a year ago. I mean, can you imagine the roller coaster of emotion that they've gone through? We're focusing on them now because they're back in the playoffs, but we, you know, we kind of quit focusing on them for a while. So, what did they learn about each other? How did their relationship galvanize, not friendship, relationship? How did it galvanize to get to where they are now, right? Adam Stevens and Christopher Bell had to walk off a couple times last year just to advance through. And I will tell you that I saw a lot of championship fours and I didn't see Bell in many of them. When I look at the odds mm -hmm. in Las Vegas, Bell was the longest of the eight drivers. Maybe that's what galvanized them. Maybe they look together. Let's not forget Adam Stevens has done it. He has the trophy on the wall. Um, maybe he, well, not maybe. We know that he worked with the Hall of Famer with Kyle Busch. Maybe he sees those same skill sets with Chris. Like we don't know what it is. The key though is that there isn't a blueprint. That's what makes Rick Hendrick, Roger Penske, uh, you know, Richard Childress, these titans of racing that continue to put the right pairings together. Coach Gibbs, you know, that's what makes them so special is that they find this, this group 
uh, or this duo. And, and, you know, I list the owners, but I really believe it's below them. It's the director of competitions. It's the team presidents that are in it every single day trying to find the right pairings. I mean, look at Rudy Fugel and William Byron. I didn't have Rudy Fugel on my radar when they announced him as his new crew chief. Bravo to Chad or, or Rick or whoever over there decided it was going to be, or maybe it was William, maybe it was William's dad. I don't know who came up with this idea, but they just seem to be so um, cohesive. Look at Sam Mayer and the breakout he's having yeah. with Marty Lindley on the pit box. Like, you know, the answer isn't the same for everybody. The result is the car has to get there. How do you need to get there? And, you know, um, man, they're, they're really, really good. The crew chiefs on top of the pit boxes are really, really good. I think there's, their job is as hard as they've ever been because they have so much information coming at them. And the structures really have changed. There's one guy who's still the offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator and head coach, and he's getting such an influx of information. And I think their jobs are as hard as ever. Um, and I think that's what – makes managing the, the emotion of it even more difficult, right? Because on the left side, you have to be analytical and it's all about the numbers. Then you also have to be able to jump over the fence and be this um, psychologist, psychiatrist, coach. Emo you know, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting mix. We talk about driver crew chief, but if you really broke down the entire teams, you see the layers of crew chiefs throughout the group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, you mentioned that that not many people had Christopher Bell in the championship four wasn't on anybody's radar really in Vegas or anywhere else. Uh, and even after Vegas, that race, Christopher Bell said, you know, th that was my golden ticket. That was my moment. Um, it didn't seem like he had a ton of confidence coming into Homestead Miami Speedway. Did, did it take you by surprise that he was able to win this race and run as well as he well, did at the end? Well, I got my legal pad out. You know, you love my legal pads. Um, we sat down with each of the championship 16 drivers when the playoffs started all the way back at race one. Christopher Bell, this is back now. So this is seven weeks ago. Um, they had the playoff. They had the pit crew change that was announced and some other things. And we just asked some very simple questions. And I think, like I said before, I think Christopher is very articulate. I always love how we, we did a round table at the Hall of Fame and he gave some real pointed opinions on the sport and the schedule and the things that I didn't see out of a younger driver. And I really appreciate him taking the time and effort to have a real solid opinion. And at this moment, he sat down, he looked right at me and he goes, these are the best cars I've ever driven. They're unbelievable. And I was like, really? Because, you know, we haven't quite seen all this. And he said, absolutely. He goes, I'm looking for a mentally fresh start. I'm ready to get going again, get into the playoffs. It's been a long regular season. And his statement was, if we do our jobs, we can win. He didn't say if I do my job. He didn't say if they do their job. He didn't say if the pit crew does his job. He said we. And he didn't say we in a fight decision or like it just naturally rolled off his tongue. And what we saw yesterday was that. That the crew chief had to do his job, both making the car better as, a, as the track cooled, car turned a little bit better. And I'm, I'm going to give him adjustments as well. He makes his car better. Christopher Bell has some of the best restarts we've seen all year long. The pit crew, while they did lose a couple spots, they didn't have a disaster. Like everybody kind of did their thing. So, you know, I'm going to give credit to the driver who, who this is seven weeks ago, who made that statement. And maybe all of us didn't give him enough credit because now here he is. Right? He's going to go to Martinsville and he's going to run 500 laps, but, but he's mentally on to Phoenix. You think of the emotion it took last year for him to get there needing to win Martinsville. Uh, and then he wins Martinsville and Ross Chastain has like one of the best moves in NASCAR history. So even the, the win in your in didn't quite get the coverage that maybe it deserved, right? So I just wonder if Christopher Bell's like, keep doubting us. Keep yeah. underestimating us. You know, he's yeah. not saying that. But that is that the motivation of Christopher Bell? You know, he had Kyle Busch in front of him, which definitely, you know, will, will take some spotlight away from whoever it is. Now he has Denny Hamlin, who takes a lot of spotlight. One of the most vocal drivers in the sports. Right. He has Martin Truex Jr. Everybody talks about Truex a champion. Like, is Christopher Bell, is he finally like, you know what? Keep, go ahead. Just keep doubting us. Doubt me all the way to victory lane. Yeah. Uh, no reason to doubt him now. He's in the championship four race in Phoenix. Uh, let's take a look at some of the other guys. Mark my words. When the odds come out, he still won't be a favorite. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I And you're right. That, that could be that single-minded motivation is that people always overlook. I'd be team. selling it. If I'm Adam Stevens, man, I'd have every headline <laughs> clipped. Look, they don't even know who we are. 
<laughs> well, like I said, they're in. Um, some other guys aren't, uh, and some surprises, I think, there. Uh, Tyler Reddick, uh, top 10 at Homestead, but maybe didn't dominate the way people were expecting. Uh, Chris Busher outrun throughout the race by his teammate, Brad Kozlowski. He's now 45 points, I think, below. Goes to Martinsville in a must win. Uh, and even William Byron, Stevie, he was kind of a little – he had top 10 finish, but he – express some concern i think for martinsville because you know those guys leaving instead going to martinsville i think size up for them uh we'll start with william byron i still think he's okay in the points uh he had a good short run car not the long run car he was looking for um you know i think they're going to be okay chris busher you know I think the same thing. This is the breakout season for them. I don't, I don't think whether they advance or don't advance, while well, they're not going to say this, nor should they say this with a race still to go, I think it's the success of the year has been there. The only concern, not concern, but what I would have circled is why was the six so good and us so poor? Just because the 17 and the six have run so close to each other all year long, it seemed very odd that Brad was very, very good and Chris wasn't. How did we divert at the time where we needed to be together that the most? How did we divert? And maybe that was car, maybe it was driver, maybe it was a combination of decisions that got him there. Um, and Tyler Reddick, you know, I think, I think it's the same thing. I think it's 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 you know, you got they got to remain patient. Twenty three eleven got two cars into the playoffs, and and they have a chance to move a car through. I think um, the reason all three of those conversations aren't a concern to me is because I think all three of them are still heading in the right direction, regardless of the results at Martinsville. Uh, William Byron's had a monster breakout year, and I think he's pretty good at Martinsville as far as looking at the points. Chris Busher has had a career breakout year, so you know let's move that momentum into next year. And Tyler Reddick and 2311 has grown together. So I think that's what you kind of kind of have to look at. The most important thing is to try to dissect, take the emotion out of these races and really understand the decisions you made and why you made them car-wise, position-wise, because I expect all three of them to probably be back in this position at some point next year, either around the 16, 12, or 8. Uh, and that's really the key to it all. Truex is the one you kind of skipped over, right? And it's because, you know, you just wonder how much gas is left in the tank for this guy, right? He was going to yeah. – is he coming back? Is he coming back? Is he coming back? It's been the last couple of years. He missed the playoffs. Um, he announces he's coming back earlier this year with a monster regular season and the playoffs have been just so bad. Um, you know, I will say this, this is going to sound crazy. And, but if the 19 wins Martinsville, sometimes walking out of the lowest of lows to the highest of highs is like a, uh, you know, it's like that adrenaline, right? You can get injured and you can walk on a broken leg for a mile because you didn't know it was broken. And then when the adrenaline comes in, you can't even stand, you know, when the adrenaline disappears, you can't stand up. So it would be a tall task from where they left Miami. But no, I should say no team, but I can't think of a team that's quite had the ups and downs they've had in the last, say, 20 months. Um, so if if they, I mean, listen, they, they righted the ship from last year, missing the playoffs, become the regular season champ. That is a major turnaround. It's hard to do at a track like Martinsville, but if they right the ship in the last race of the playoffs before Phoenix, man, oh man, would it be? Would it? it it'd be. I, you know what? I wouldn't. I couldn't wait till Thursday's press conferences in Phoenix because I'd want to sit there and I'd want to start asking, "All right, what's the deal? How did we get here?" <laughs> well, when I look at the four guys below the cut line right now, and Tyler Reddick and Chris Busher have one top 10 each in their careers at Martinsville. One top 10. So, I mean, Hamlin and Truex come in 17 points below. But to me, if if there's one driver getting into the championship four from those four, it's one of those two at this point, right? I mean... So, you know, one thing I will say is they're the right eight because stats agree. Right? Look, past history agrees with everything you just said. Um, I didn't have Ryan Blaney win the 600. I didn't have him running the top five. Mm -hmm. And he showed up, boom, on the scene. I didn't have Blaney being this good at Miami. So, so my, my point is that did you have Chris Buescher in the playoffs? Let's start with the playoffs. Did you have Chris Buescher in the playoffs? No way. And here he is in the round of eight. Did you have William Byron winning six races? And my example in this is 
Why do sports dominate television? Because athletes and teams continue to rewrite the rules and the record books. And it wouldn't shock me if Denny Hamlin has a walk-off win. It wouldn't shock me if Tyler Reddick would like, like what makes sports great is it's not, it's not, you know, made for TV reality TV. It's real life that we get to cover from the broadcast booth. And I have a better idea after practice going in. Do I think Chris Buescher has a high chance? Nope. I don't think he's going to be great there. I think he's probably going to run good. He'll run somewhere fifth to 12th, fifth to 13th and have a great, you know, I think it's going to take a win. I think we're going to see a winning performance out of the playoff eight. Um, just which one will it be? And, and I mean, that's what makes this so great. And this car makes it even harder. I think it was way easier to predict the sport before the next gen car. I think it's made it much, much more difficult to understand who's going to be good each week. I've got one last one for you. You mentioned you felt like William Byron, he's 30 points above, is in a good spot. But again, Byron did not express much confidence about Martinsville, even though this is a guy who was first and seventh at this track last year. Um, it, it, shouldn't this theoretically, Stevie, be a, a, a race where he can go to, I mean, stage one is 130 laps, stage two, 130 laps, that he and Rudy Fugel can approach this and say, if we just get stage points, first, second stage, I mean, again, barring disasters, which can happen at Martinsville, but he's 30 points up. Shouldn't they be able to do this without having to worry about where they actually finish at this race? Well, well everyone has a worry because when you have the year this good, you don't want to be the one that doesn't make it to the championship four. It's all right there in front of you. Everything you've talked about, every meeting you've held, every rah-rah luncheon with the group. Um, it, you, you jumped actually ahead of where I would start. It doesn't start in stage one. It starts on Saturday. Um, hmm. If you look at Martinsville and the variety of the, the field and how it goes, I think William Byron can lock himself into the championship four by qualifying in the top five on Saturday. I think if he qualifies in the top five on Saturday, then you will be hard pressed to get him out of the top five before stage one and stage two. He could score eight to 15 stage points and then race with his mittens a little bit for the rest of the race and just cruise off into the sunset of, of the Phoenix desert. Um, yeah. Now the flip is, John Hunter hasn't got to qualify in two of the last three weeks with oil leaks or mechanical. Like, you know, what is Mike Tyson's favorite line? And I do love this one. You know, Nate, Everybody's everyone has a plan. plan until you get punched in the mouth, right? <laughs> Everybody has a plan until you get right. punched in the mouth. And that's right. really what we saw. Everybody had a plan, and then Chris Rebell lost his mind because he got punched in the mouth, and here came the leader. Truex got punched in the mouth with a bad spit stop and then a yellow, right? So William Byron's probably sitting there going, well, we should. Well, you know how many shoulds go wrong in sports, right? Everybody has a plan until you get punched in the mouth. So instead of worrying about stage one and stage two, I would worry about qualifying. Let's go there. Let's practice. Let's qualify. After qualifying, that will work on the race. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We qualify well at Martinsville. We get a good pit stall. We get everything is better if we qualify well. All right, well, there you have it. Every minute will matter this weekend at Martinsville, which is why you should watch not only Sunday, but Saturday's very important qualifying session. Also, the Xfinity race uh, setting in their championship field. Unfortunately, didn't have time to talk about that, but that's Saturday as well. Tune in Sunday, though. NBC, Steve Letarte on the call. NASCAR and NBC coverage will set the championship four for Phoenix. Stevie, as always, appreciate you being here. Thanks for joining the NBC, NASCAR and NBC podcast. Man, thanks for having me. It's a great time of year. A couple to go. Uh, we got to set the field, then we head out west to crown some champions. It's going to be a great time. Hi, I'm Parker Kligerman. For more access like this from Pit Road, be sure to click and subscribe to the Motorsports and NBC YouTube channel.